Okay, let's now have a look at the STM32L4 architecture. So what we're going to see in this section is the internal structure of the STM32L4. All the key features and system blocks that make up the STM32L4, including all the peripherals. And you'll see an overview of the capabilities of the STM32L4. The STM32L4 series of devices, even though it's defined as L for low power, the biggest feature of the STM32L4 is it is a high performance device. The core that's inside the STM32L4 is the ARM Cortex-M4F. It's got all the features that go with a Cortex-M4 core. It's got the very complex bus matrix with instruction bus, data bus and system bus. It can do SIMD instructions, so the single instruction, multiple data uh, functionality. And it's still got the same 12 cycle interrupt latency as all Cortex devices have. So inside the core, if we look at the main system blocks connected for memory, you can see that the one mega flash, or up to one mega flash, is connected through the ART accelerator onto the instruction and the data bus. The SRAM is split into two different blocks. Both of these blocks can be accessed from the instruction and the data bus. And all of these blocks of SRAM have four bits of parity inside as well, so that you can do the integrity check of the RAM. As well as the main one mega flash, we have a section of OTP uh, memory for storing serial numbers, uh, calibration values, um, other items that you might need permanently to be remembered inside the system. And it also covers the system memory, which contains the system bootloaders for the STM32L4. Down at the bottom, we also have now on the external memory bus, we have the NOR, NAND, PSRAM and SRAM. So all of these sit on the FMC. And separately, we have a new interface on this device, which will be explained later, which is the Quad SPI. So this can provide us access to serial uh, flash over the Quad SPI interface. As the Cortex M4F is a master on the bus, we also have two more masters, which is DMA1 and DMA2. Each of these DMAs has seven independent channels inside the DMA structure so that we can get fast transfers from peripherals into any of the RAM or other memory devices on the bus. So as you can see from the bus matrix, there is a connecting dot between all the DMAs and all the different types of RAM. So any peripheral can send information into or out from the uh, all the different types of memory that are available in this STM32L4 device. The last two items that sit on the bus matrix are the high-speed peripheral bridges. Uh, so there are two of those. There's high-speed peripheral bridge number one and high-speed peripheral bridge number two. Peripheral bridge number one is connected to the two independent peripheral bridges, which are then split across all the various peripherals, timers, UARTs, SPI I squared C, etc. Peripheral bridge number two, high-speed peripheral bridge number two, is dedicated to just a small handful of peripherals, which is the ADC, USB, GPIO, and for the devices that contain encryption, the AES encryption cell, and the random number generator. 
Again, as I said earlier, because the DMAs can send information from any peripheral into any memory location, both these high-speed peripheral uh, bridges are connected with the dots on the bus matrix so that they can be linked to any of the uh, memory locations on the device. Clock sources for the STM32L4 are large. Um, we have multiple different clocks available as input sources and we have various parameters that can be set for each of these clock sources. By default, we will always start with the MSI clock, so the medium speed internal or multi-speed internal uh, oscillator. So this can go as slow as 100 kilohertz, but up to 48 megahertz. The default from reset of this particular clock source is four megahertz. The precision of this clock source across the whole temperature range is plus and minus three percent. And the startup time of this particular clock source is approximately two and a half microseconds for this clock. That is the reason why it is the default clock source. Then we have multiple other clocks available. So we have the two high speed clock sources, HSE and HSI. HSI is the internal RC, 16 megahertz. Startup time for this one is about 3.8 microseconds, so again slightly longer than the MSI. But with this one you have plus and minus 1% tolerance across the whole temperature range that's shown, so 0 to 85 degrees. HSE is the external crystal, so we can have an external crystal of somewhere between 4 and 48 megahertz. The resolution or precision of this crystal will be down to the external cr uh, crystal that's attached, but you can get plus and minus 0.01% or 100 parts per million available depending on what crystal you've used. The downside or the negative of having such a high precision external crystal, your startup time is slightly longer now, so you're up to 2 milliseconds for the startup time. All of these high speed and MSIs can use the PLL. So the PLL is technically another clock source. So the PLL can give you anything from two megahertz up to the maximum 80 megahertz that the device can go at. And the setup time or stabilization, stabilization time of the PLL once you've started the device is about 15 microseconds. So if you wanted to use the, any of the clock sources up to the maximum 80 megahertz, you will first have to calculate the time that it takes for that particular clock source to stabilize. Then you will need to add the stabilization, stabilization time of the PLL on top of that clock source. Then finally, we have the two low speed clocks available. So we've got an LSI, which is the low speed internal RC. This runs at 32 kilohertz. Not the most accurate clock source in the, um, on the device, at approximately 10% tolerance. And it's not the fastest startup time, 125 microseconds. But it is one of the lowest current consumptions clocks available to you on the device. So it's fantastic for running any of the low power features of the STM32 L4. And then the final clock source we have is the LSE. Uh, this is the external 32.76H uh, watch crystal. Again, the tolerance or precision of this device is excellent, so 20 parts per million. So very, very good clock source for the real-time clock of the device if you need to keep very accurate timings inside the STM32 L4. But this is one of the clock sources that you will start once and never switch off again. This settle, settling time of this clock source is about two seconds. So this is something that you will set up right at the beginning and then that will then always run probably for the lifetime of the battery or 
the device if you're using anything where real-time clock source is needed. This LSE is also used because of the accuracy to configure the MSI when it's in PLL mode. So this is where the calibration, internal calibration of the MSI comes from. It comes from this external LSE at 20 parts per million. So what debug do we have available on the STM32L4? All the debug dongles that we have, so ST-Link, Cow-U Link Pro, the IRA, IAR J-Link, are all available to use on the device. Um, you can do it through the programming, debugging, and code analysis. So all of these debug environments can do programming and full code analysis. They do the basic debugging features, and if you have things like the U-Link Pro or the J-Link Pro, you can do the advanced features that use the embedded trace macrocell, which is part of the Cortex M4 core, uh, to help you identify very in-depth um, bugs that may occur in the application as you're developing um, your product. One of the niceties about all these debug tools and some of the third-party PC applications, these are very good for doing code coverage and code profiling. So all these debug tools are available to do all these extra PC application-based um, support.